Hey everyone, welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. If you're tuning in on YouTube or any of the podcast directories, make sure to leave us a follow. That's how I keep on bringing amazing guests like the one I have on today. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Andrew, I know you personally, we've been able to connect several times, but for anyone that may not know you or hasn't had the pleasure yet to meet you, who are you and what do you do? Hey, John, it's great to see you again. It's crazy in this podcasting space because I feel like we're friends, like we know each other really well. (laughs) Because we've talked so many times, we've never actually met in person. I know, yeah. Yeah, but it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you again for having me on tonight. My name is Andrew Lenzo, the owner of three, excuse me, I'm the owner of 734 Marketing. I'm also a podcast host. I host the Marketing and Coffee podcast out in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Amazing. And Andrew, tell us a little bit about your walk to I'd love to ask this question. You have to go a little bit in deep, in depth, more in depth into your story. Tell us. What was money like growing up in your household? What was the dynamic with you and your parents or whoever raised you in your household? What was that kind of like growing up? And how did those conversations in your household kind of shift your mindset around money? It was a weird transition as I was growing up. About the time that I got into high school, my parents were doing very well. But while I was growing up, things were pretty rough. Money was pretty tight. I wouldn't say that we had it terrible because there's a lot of people who had it worse than us. But it definitely was something that got me really cautious about money from a young age. When you're counting change to see what groceries you can pick up from the store, that kind of tells you that it's something you need to keep in the back of your head. So my parents read a lot of Dave Ramsey growing up, Mm -hmm. uh, very, very conscious about, very conscious about money. So by the time I was old, old enough to be taking care of myself, it's something I kept in the back of my head. Yeah. And how did that start playing out into your teenage years? You have your own business now, but. Was that entrepreneurial seed kind of like implanted in you early on? And is it something that you kind of stumbled across in your later years? I think it's something that comes from my family. My grandpa was very much a person. He was very, very mindful about business. Both my grandparents were. And they always were trying to think two or three steps ahead. There wasn't a lot of trust in my family around employers for them (laughs) treating you well. So it was always about trying to find a way to make sure that you were set up for success, regardless of the outcomes around you. You know, there's always stuff that's going to happen that's out of your control. But as long as you keep your head up, you put a plan in place, you'll, you'll be just fine. Yeah, no, I've been starting to really adopt the mindset that the only security that you will ever have in life is when you take things into your own hands. That's the only time you'll ever experience true security, whether that's financially, whether that's in your relationship, whether it, if, if it's in someone else's hands, you will never, ever be secure, I feel. And so let me ask you, because now you're in the marketing world, you're making a pretty big dent in that area. Uh, was that something that you kind of picked up in college? I know for me, I went into college for marketing before I left school, but was it something that you were always interested in? What kind of geared you towards the topic of marketing? So I went into college as a cellist. I went to college as a cellist. I was originally going to be performing like side by side with the Detroit Orchestra and the Grand Rapids Symphony. And then I ended up in politics. I was a political scientist for a while. I I bounced around a lot. It took me a while to figure out what path I really wanted to go down. It wasn't until I kind of went into journalism. I started working with our school paper that I realized that there was really something about marketing that it was drawing me to. Mm -hmm. I think Growing up, I did watch a lot of like satire, like the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. Yeah. And I also watched a lot of YouTubers like Casey Neistat and a lot of filmmakers. And I think something about that just sort of clicked for me and it made me passionate about what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, were the entrepreneurial spirit, you got that bug in you implanted or, or that little pull and you drawing you towards marketing, but entrepreneurship, I mentioned it was something that your, your family always mentioned being two or three steps ahead. But what was it like kind of stepping into it to start your own business? What was it like? What were, where were you at mentally around that time? What was it like telling that to your friends and family? What were their thoughts around the idea? Were you, you know, um, welcomed with a bunch of support where people were giving you like sly little comments or, oh, a business or little things like that where people sometimes kind of cast their insecurities around the idea of owning your own business and entrepreneurship on you? What was it like navigating the world at that time? Oh, they hate it. They still hate it. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, I, I was a journalist. I wasn't making a lot of money Yeah, right out of college. And I decided, what what do I have to lose if I try this? And that's kind of been my mentality throughout my entire career has been, okay, I, doing this is no more secure than having a full-time job in this day and age. So why not just go for it? 
I'm very passionate about this. I'm going to put the work in and give it a hundred percent compared to if I'm just trying to get a certain amount of tasks done for a day for a corporation. So, you know, that's kind of, that's been my mindset. I'm just trying to make great content and do a great job for these small businesses that need our work. And that's where, uh, that's where I sit. I think that's a great segue to really get into today's conversation about marketing, right? So entrepreneurship is one of the best wealth builders, right? There. Real estate has made the most millionaires in this country, but it's through business ownership that's made the most billionaires, right? And one of the key facets to any successful business is marketing, because if no one knows what you got going on, it doesn't matter if you got the best product or service on the market, you don't got it in front of nobody, you don't got it in front of any of anybody, and now you don't have any customers because no one knows that you even exist. So tell us, you know, how how should someone who's newer into entrepreneurship whether they want to get into marketing as their business or they're just trying to market their business, what, where does someone re- begin with this idea of marketing? Because you'll, you'll go online and you'll get so many different ideas. You look at social media, content creators, influencers, and you got ads, copywriting, all this different, you know, different jargon and terminology, the terms you could throw around and routes you can go down within the world of marketing. But where does one kind of start finding their lane? When you're first starting out, I even have this discussion with bigger businesses we work with, you need to be unique because the, the market is so saturated. Anybody our age knows it. If you go onto YouTube, you go onto any social media platform, there are millions of pieces of content that somebody could consume on, on the day. So you really need to find a way to set yourself apart. And you also need to find a way to provide, show that you're providing value to your customers. So the first thing I always tell people to think about is what are you offering? What are you offering to that business or to that customer? Is it valuable? Is there actually a need for it? Like, is somebody going to buy it if they see it? And then to build your brand, kind of build it around you, build it around your personality, build it around the sort of things that you like to do, good things that are icebreakers when you get onto a sales call. If you're a sports fan, maybe you can lean into that a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're into music, you can lean into that. Little ways like that to kind of break the ice and just make yourself relatable on a call. Nobody wants to work with somebody that they don't know. And unfortunately, in the Zoom age, you don't know anybody, but there are little things that you can do to try to connect with your customers. And that's one of them. Yeah. So let me ask you, you mentioned, you threw it in there, right? That your brand, what is that, right? Because a lot of people, they get this idea of brand. And so is that the swoosh? Does the swoosh or is that the, the three stripes or is that the, the, the two G's next to for Gucci, right? Is it just the logo? Is it the, the colors behind it? Like what actually is a brand? There's so much that goes into it and so many people misunderstand what a brand actually means. So like in your terms, how would you define what is a brand? When I first got into marketing, I told myself I wouldn't throw any of that jargon around. <laughs> and here I am doing it. If only this for like four years, I'm already doing it. Yeah, brand, a brand is, it's a feeling, it's an emotion. It can be, it's something visual. It's really when somebody hears your name or when they hear your business, what first comes to mind? That's really what your brand is. It can go all the way down to the fonts that you use on your graphics and the colors. It can go down to the logo. But really for us, it's all about the whole team behind that as well. If somebody's coming to do business with you, who are they speaking to? What type of language do they use? Are, are you more results driven? Are you more emotionally driven? Do you want to make sure that your customer is comfortable? Are you? Are you more, or are you more results driven? Like, are you making sure that all these deadlines are being met and you're actually providing? So a lot of that goes into a brand. When you're first starting out, the first thing to do is kind of take a look at yourself and figure out who you are, what you want to provide, and then start to build that brand around that. Yeah, no, I, I, I see a lot of people when they talk about getting your brand, uh, the idea of just be yourself. It's easier said than done, right? Because a lot of time, especially for like a lot of my listeners, we're getting started in in something at a very early year age. And even if we're getting started in a later age, it's it's hard kind of to adopt that new identity that you have to adopt to be in order to be successful without having to fake the person that you are. And a lot of people, it's a, it's a tightrope to like kind of navigate because you go too far either direction, it'll harm you because if you don't, you fake who you are for so long, you'll build up this brand. And then when you finally come to the light, it was like, hey, you're not the John, you're not the Andrew that I thought you were, right? But then also, if you don't kind of shift your mindset a little bit, 
then you won't be able to step into the person you need to become to like achieve success in this world of entrepreneurship. So what kind of mindset shift do you have to make in order to start being comfortable and embrace your, your personality and your skills and your talents and all the things that we've been blessed with that we kind of like, for whether it's anxiety or imposter syndrome, whatever it may be, we kind of, that suppresses us. So how, how do we embrace ourselves and make our brand be us and not this, this facade that we may put up? There are billions of people in the world going back to working in a Zoom environment. One of the pros of that is that you can connect with people from all across the world. People who are going to be very similar to you have a very similar mindset. So things like your anxieties or anything that you might see as a flaw, billions of other people in the world have the same thing. So really, when you're building your brand, be true to yourself. You don't need to fake anything. You don't need to put on a fancy suit and go and buy a, a corporate office to start a business. It really just depends. Know who you're going to work with. Know your client. It should, it should be built off of your personality and then build your business around that. Yeah. When I first started out, I made a list. I had a notebook out. I wrote down my qualities, you know, my personality, the type of people that I would like to work with. And I kind of built it around that. So embrace your flaws. Being vulnerable is a really good way to connect mm. with somebody that you're trying to sell to as well. And if it's not working out, then they're not the right customer for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't, don't move around your own, don't move around your own mindset for just one customer that you're trying to sell to, because that's going to turn off all of the other customers that actually fit your mindset that you're trying to work with. Yeah, it's, it's all back to that, that vibration, right? If you're, you, you attract the whatever you're vibrating on and, and you'll find your people that come to you, whether you realize it or not. And uh, you and mentioned you're going to do a better job too. I yeah. mean, that's the other thing is in the end, you're going to do a better job at the work you're doing and you're going to get more results for that person than if you're trying to fake it for somebody else. So, yeah. And then another good point too is, is that when you're, you change that your mindset to not come from a place of scarcity, you'll know that there will, will come a customer that actually fits your criteria and fits your mindset. But it's like, most of us, especially when we come from like scarce beginnings or what, some of us that get into entrepreneur, entrepreneurship later in the game, usually we pick up a retail job or two. And in those, those places, we're taught the employee is always right. We're taught to make everything happen in the customer service. It's not really customer service. It's a customer gets his ways no matter what, even if he's wrong, right? Which is not really how it works in the entrepreneurship, and at least not how it should work in the entrepreneurship world. Cause you have a lot more, a lot more decision making power to decide who it is that you want to work with and who it is that you didn't, didn't want, want to work with. How, you, how do you design that ideal avatar, right? Because you mentioned several times about knowing who you want to work with, what language they're using. How do we start putting that stuff together? Because most of the time we just think like, hey, I want to start this business. The client's going to come. They're going to find me. I'm going to make some posts on social media, but whatever. But it's like with messaging, and there's so much more that goes into it. So how do we get specific and narrow down for everyone that's new, kind of newer to this entrepreneurship space so that we can, the niches that are in the riches, they say, right, though? How can we find that ideal avatar to present our offer to whatever, whoever, like whatever the offer may be? So the important thing to do is to stay unique. So there are some things that aren't unique though, that you're going to be able to pick up on. Yeah. If you're like a lot of our customers are in the manufacturing space. So let's say that you're going to sell to a distributor in, I don't know, somewhere in the Northeast, we'll say New York, you're selling it to a distributor in New York. You know how much money they're making. You can go on Zoom Info and you can look up all of that data. You can look up where you need, where you need to go, who you need to talk to, to in order to make that sale. That's great. That's one side of it. Once you have all that research done, you know that there's a need for your service. You know what's going to help, you know, those businesses. Yeah. Then you go take a step back and then you look at your brand. So there's, like I said, there's tons of people doing the same thing you're doing. What makes you more unique than them when you're selling? Are you, are you super into music? Are you a sports guy? Build your avatar, build your profile around that. Yeah, definitely. Think about some of those things that set you apart, create, just take a few good photos. They don't have to be anything professional. I definitely recommend getting on LinkedIn, getting on Instagram, those spaces. Don't build it like you're a business person, literally build it as a person, mm -hmm. you know, relatable. And then kind of drive your messaging around that as well. You don't want to make it too salesy. 
you definitely want to promote the service that you're offering and show why it's going to help that person's business. But at the same time, you want to show why you're a good person to talk to. Yeah. And why, why is somebody not going to be annoyed when they get on a sales call with you? Yeah. And kind of combining those two and finding the sweet spot is a really good recipe for success in the branding space. Yeah. So let me ask you, right, when you were starting your marketing business, how did you start finding clients? How did you start finding people so you can get your business off the ground? Because as you said, like a lot of this, a lot of these spaces that we're getting into are, is already like super, super saturated. There's tons of people. There's tons of content. There's tons of information. There's tons of different options. How, how do you, one, you mentioned finding what your unique value proposition is or your unique selling point is. But like, how does one then articulate that to the market? How do we get that out there? How do we take that from, because we know what we're good at. We know what we like to do. We know what makes us who we are. But then a lot of the times it's like there's a disconnect between who we are and like what's coming across, right? Because it's, it's, it's kind of hard to think about how would someone else perceive the message. So what kind of advice do you have there in terms of like, how can we get that unique value proposition, that unique skills and gifts that we have? from in our head and in our in ourselves to out in front of the world and articulate it in a way that's very clear to, and easy to understand. You mentioned perception. That is a very important thing to look at because you may feel like you're you're saying everything that you need to say, but if somebody else perceives it a different way, you're not going to get anywhere. That was a great point. Mm-hmm. Um, ask business owner, like grow a tough skin and go ask them. Say, hey, we're starting up this journey. I, we have the idea for doing X, Y, and Z. We think it's going to solve this problem. Yeah. What would you buy it? If you got five minutes, just talk us through what you think is good about this idea. What's bad about it. Take a look at some of our socials and some of our websites. See if any of this speaks to you. Mm-hmm. And that's the best way to learn it. And the way to sell it to them, like we're trying to help your business. We're not asking you to buy anything. We're not charging you anything. Just wonder if you could take a look at this and see if there's anything that we can do to improve it, to help you. Yeah. And so how does someone then get the, the courage and, and, and the knowledge to ask the right questions? Because it's one thing to show up and it's like, hey, I got this thing. But then there's another thing to say, show up and come in with some intentionality as to knowing what to ask, knowing what to, how does one talk to other businesses? What, what's the kind of the, the type of language and verbiage that you use when talking to the other business owners or other potential clients that they may be looking for to speak to. Yeah. So you need to have a really clear intention. You need to be respectful of people's time. That's another big thing. Business owners are super busy, but if you come to them with an idea that could help their business, they'll be more receptive to listening to it. We had a really good guest on Glenn Rudin. He's the messaging master on the marketing and coffee. He talks a lot about clear messaging, speaking with intent. That's very important when you go into a meeting like that, or if you even just give a quick phone call to ask about it. Yeah, But in order to gain that confidence, you've really just got to be confident in yourself, be confident in the product that you're selling. For me, I, I gained that during journalism, during my journalism career. Mm-hmm. Before that, I was very introverted, didn't talk to a lot of people, didn't have a lot to say. That really taught me to get a thick skin and just put myself in uncomfortable positions. But you just got to, you got to think outside the box and say, hey, this is really something that I want to do. I want to do, I'm going to do anything I can to be successful. So anything that makes me uncomfortable, I'm going to do it because it's going to help further my business and you just got to do it. Yeah. And I kind of want to ask you, right, that the idea of getting comfortable with the dis- discomfort, right? It's something that it's very counterintuitive. It's, it's not saying that act as if you're, you're comfortable because it's discomforting. For example, if you're taking an ice bath, you know, it's discomforting, but I've seen this uh, Patrick, but David. I was on his IG one time because I follow him and he was walking outside and I like, pretty much just like some like short swimming trunks and he walked in the snow to the hot tub and his caption was in like, it was a super dope caption. It was like the body's in shock, but the mind stays in control because it was freezing cold outside. Like you see his breath and everything and he was in swimming trunks and then he's walking across the snow barefoot and then he hops in the, in the, in the bathtub, in the hot tub as if it was nothing going on. It's like, being comfortable in the in the discomfort is something that a lot of people tend to, you know, not understand how to do. Now that we kind of we're, we're starting to test out this idea, right? we're trying starting to test this theory and put it into the marketplace to see if we get any bites. Once we do start getting bites, how do we start growing with that? But what did you have to do? What mindset shift did you have to make to start to take your your marketing business from the ground and just a few clients? Is something that's running and bringing in consistent revenue? Because as entrepreneurship. 
a lot of people get into the, the super high month, super low month, and then it's just like never consistent and predictable. Passion is great, but you need to follow the numbers. Get a QuickBooks account, set aside 60% for your expenses, 20% for a rainy day, 10% for donations given back to the community, and then throw that other 10% wherever you want to. But you really need to follow your revenue and you need to follow that's that needs to be your decision maker. It's mm -hmm. easy when you're so passionate about something to want to put everything into it, which as far as your time goes, if you're making money back, go for it. But you need to separate that passion from the revenue that you're bringing in as a business. So keeping track of things like how many customers you have, how often your customers are, are signing on. Are you getting one new a month? Are you getting three new a month? Yeah. How much is that sale? How many customers are you retaining? It's great if you have 20 customers for one month, but if it drops off to 10 the next, that's something you need to plan for. Yeah. Unless somebody has pen to paper, just you don't count it. That's a mistake I made growing up. I thought we had a really good client. I thought he was going to stay on for a long time. So we had him penciled in and that was a huge part of our revenue. After three months, he dropped and then we were scrambling to find ways to make up that that money. And that's effort that could have been spent a lot better. So definitely you need to find a balance of both. Use your passion to keep you driven, keep yeah. you moving forward, keep doing the work, but follow the numbers. Yeah. Let me ask you, right? Because a lot of the times when we're starting into this entrepreneurship world, it's, it's, we don't have any revenue. We don't have any income. We don't have any, anything really is it's where we start off in the red, right? Most of us, especially when we don't have too many connections. What What's your advice there? Because of course we have to think we lead with profit, right? But it's also when we're starting something from the ground up, there's nothing to lead with, right? So what's your advice there? How can we kind of navigate that so we don't get too, but like too deep into the red, but also too, it's like when we're investing in ourselves, usually it takes a while for us to see the fruits of our labor. So what's kind of your advice? there? Don't quit your full-time job. I've worked many jobs outside of my entrepreneurship ventures. I've worked night shifts. I've worked other agency jobs. If the money's not there for what you're doing, you need to take a step back, reevaluate what you're doing. And it might just be a time thing. It might be something where you need to work another year, year and a half, get more experience and get more credibility for your own brand. But if you're putting more money back into it, that's great. But make sure you can pay your bills. Yeah. You know, make sure you can buy groceries every week. Once the revenue, you'll know when that revenue shift happens. Like I said, you might get a ton of clients one month. That's great. Get it planned out for a year. Once you have a year of stable income that's going to replace that full-time income, then take the jump. But there's mm -hmm. no shame in working another job outside of that. What's your what's your thoughts on the the, the burn all ships approach? The screw everything. I'm going to make this happen one way or another, and I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to make success for myself one way or another. Well, you don't get to say no. It's all of the customers that you're trying to sell that are going to say no right back to you. So I definitely, I agree. I agree with the, the thought of it, that if you're going to do something, you need to give it your heart and your soul. That means you're going to be working long days. It means you're going to miss sleep some nights. <laughs> you're going to have to make some sacrifices. You're not going out to the bar as much as you used to. But at the same time, you really need to listen to to your own finances and what's coming back. Don't get too caught up in an idea and that's not working and drain your whole bank account from it. If it's not working, it's okay. I think Kevin O'Leary said it. He take the dog behind the shed and it's time. Right. Now, I mean, there's plenty of businesses that did that. A lot of entrepreneur, a lot of entrepreneurs that had to do that and then created very successful businesses after that because it freed up their time and their thought to find, to make something that was really successful. If the first thing doesn't work, really don't stress about it. Like it is what it is. You, I'm sure you learned a lot from it. Take a lot of that into your next venture. Um, I think the timeline for a lot of people is two and a half to three years as well. Yeah. After that time, if you're not seeing success from it, you got to reevaluate it. You know, it's probably the idea as a whole. Maybe there's parts of it that were working really well, but don't be afraid to say, I got to stop. I got to try something new. Yeah. I wanted to ask you too, like that idea of like, you know, giving up our, on our dreams essentially to, cause a lot of time we get into this entrepreneurial world, it's like, oh, we got this burning passion. We got this new idea. It's, it's this one's going to be the one that it's our ticket out. Right. 
And then we don't see it come to light. And then it's like we get discouraged and not want to ever hop back in. What's one thing from your experience and the, you work with a lot of other business owners. What's from your experience and the experience that you've seen in other business owners is the main thing that kind of separates people who kind of just go back to their full-time job and stay there forever versus the one that find a way to break through. You can, you can tell from the first impression, worked with a lot of people who are working 16, 18 hour days, really pushing through to get, to get what they want. And I know some people who feel like they're owed it. You can tell right away. Nobody owes you anything. World doesn't revolve around you as much as you think it does. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if the, if that's how you're thinking, I I got some bad news for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Um, you can kind of tell right away from somebody who wants it and somebody who doesn't want it. They're going to show you. Yeah. They're the ones who are going to make the sacrifices to make it happen. So let me ask you though, in that, in that same thought though, there's a lot of people that's working 16, 18 hour days that never see a glimpse of financial freedom for their entire lives. And they, they work more hours than everyone on the planet, but they're on the, on the bottom percentile in terms of actual wealth and success that they've been able to accumulate across the years. It was like, what's, what's your thoughts there, right? Because with entrepreneurship, it's not like we have a set schedule. It's not like we have a set to-do list. We come into work and we have quotas and all these things like laid out for us. And a lot of the time, we, we don't even know what a lot of those things are and how the metrics that we need to look at for our own business. So like, how can we kind of like go from just working for working sake to working purposely and efficiently so that we could actually get results with with our business. Those are the people I see make it the most though, to be honest. People who are working two jobs and eventually they get the time freed up where they can put four hours, they can put eight hours a night into their own venture. They're the smartest people in the world and they're the ones who always find a way to make it out of that. Unfortunately, just the way, especially in the US, if you're a US listener, this will make so apply to you more, but just our current class system and the way that politically it's set up, it's set up to work against other people than others. So sometimes you're kind of stuck in that rut. I will say one thing to give you hope is that there are tons of free services online that you can use to take advantage of that idea you have brewing. There's free website builders, free social media schedulers, tons Mm. of free information about businesses too. So if you're looking to build a business and you want to go after a certain industry, you can look by state, you can look by revenue size to kind of build that idea around. Yeah. And Luckily, there are things like Zoom, Skype, other ways for you to communicate with business owners from across the globe. So you're not narrowed down to just that town that you live in or you work in. You have access to everybody across the United States on a very convenient way to speak to somebody too. You know, it's, they don't have to, nobody has to plan for driving to a meeting. Nobody has to plan for blocking time out of their schedule. Yeah. Hey, if you got 10 minutes, you got 15 minutes, hop on a quick Zoom call. You're good to go. So. Yeah, you went yeah. to the point that kind of made it made me think about our, our conversation before we press record earlier about there's there's always a way, and it's like when it comes to entrepreneurship, I feel like everyone should be an entrepreneur, and I don't mean that everyone should be an entrepreneur in terms of starting their own business. I feel like the entrepreneur way of living is something that everyone should strive for because all the top successful entrepreneurship entrepreneurs they're all spending an abs- absurd amount of money on masterminds on coaching on self-improvement, on courses, on conferences, on networking events, and things like that. So it's like, of course, there's always going to be a need for employees. And some people's, whether it's financial or for their family situation or whatever the reason may be, may not be in that position. Or whether they're not, maybe they're not even like willing or able to take on the load that you have to bear as an entrepreneur mentally, right? For whatever reason that may be. But it's like, That way of living as an entrepreneur, it's like striving to become the best version of yourself, striving to provide value to the marketplace, striving to be of service to the world at a greater scale, at least for the entrepreneurs that do it for a good reason. And that's something that kind of definitely like you'll find that aligns throughout all of them. I want to ask you, how does one then kind of take their business from something that's just like, hey, let me just make the side hustle to make some money to have something that they could actually stand behind to tie it back to what we're talking about brand. How do we let that brand shine through our business and not just bringing home money? That's a big question. I got two parts to that. First one is you got to define what you see as financial freedom. 
For me, I see it as flexibility with my time and my schedule. Some people might see that differently. So you you have to have that idea in the back of your head of what you want to work towards. The second thing, I believe more in people than I do with a product or a service. Investing in people is a huge expense, especially if you're bringing in an employee, but it's a really good payoff because you bring in all of these creative ideas and people who are really good at what they do that can help fill some of those weaknesses that you have. You know, another way to kind of build yourself up, especially if you're a minority business, LGBT, women-owned business, there are plenty of networking groups out there designed just for you. So you can speak with people in a similar situation that you are in. And networking groups like that have really helped me because I'm in, I'm in the same, I'm in the same space as a lot of these people. We mm-hmm. get to talk through a lot of the same problems that we're having and come up with these creative solutions around it. So it's easier to work your way up with more than one person than just by yourself. So try to find a way to surround yourself with like-minded people yeah. who are also going to push you and push you to be a better business person. Let me ask you an uh, interesting question, right? So when it comes to networking events, how does how do you come in there with the intentionality to let your brand shine through during these events, right? Because a lot of the time we think of brand, we think of our business, right? But it's also, it's it's us, right? So how do we showcase our brand when we go to these events? How do we let our brand shine through so that no matter whose hands we shake, they know that, hey, Andrew, yo, he, he's a good guy. Like he, he has integrity. He he's, does a good, uh, has a good service and the whole nine yards. So. How does one kind of like leverage those networking events? Because it's one thing to show up, but it's like, can you show up as you, as your brand or during these events to really make some more meaningful and impactful connections? The only reason I know the answer to this is because I screwed this up so many times starting out. But when you go in, like we had mentioned before, you're unique. You're your own person. Be yourself. You have to make a really strong impression when you go in. So make sure sh- no, you're not going to get respect. You're not going to get that integrity across from the first meeting, but definitely have a strong first impression. Back up anything that you say, speak honestly. Don't try to BS your way around certain things or don't try to finagle your way around other things. I'm not sure if I can say the BS, yeah. but just be yourself. Have a really good business card. That's one thing that I learned early on. Look for the most generic business cards, like go to a networking event, get 20 of them. And then make one that looks nothing like any of those that will stand out. Um, same thing with your website or with your social pages. Look at everybody else who's at those events and then go online and make a profile that looks completely different that somebody is going to remember. That, no, that's an amazing point. And you know, the reason I love that point is that's something I mastered. I have the most dynamic one-two punch, I feel like. And like all the real estate conferences that I go to, I kid you not, it was actually... A one, two, three punch, right? It it was a triple combo. So here's the combo, right? So the triple D, the, the, yeah, the triple D, man. This, this combo has not failed me yet. So my hair is down now, but I have a giant curly fro when my hair is out, right? I have a great hair. So like the, the first step is make sure my hair is on point that day. I got to have the curls in full effect. That's step one, right? Step number two, I have this shirt that I created, which is kind of how I created Stop and Stare Media. But the shirt says, stop and stare, just don't touch the hair, right? And have my real estate logo, right? So that's step corny, number but two. I love it. And, and corny, but it works. So it works. And a lot of these networking events, yeah. the people are much older than me. So they they eat it up. And it's, they eat that stuff up. And then the third, the third punch that really seals the deal, especially when you're going to networking events where the demographic of people is people that are a lot older than you. And this definitely works very well, especially if you're someone that happens to be younger, which a lot of you guys are, having a digital business card. But here's the thing. So a lot of digital business cards, they have a QR code. The one I got is called a dot card. It, it just tap and scan. Same way you tap your credit card. Got yeah. The popple. Yeah. And you just, you just tap it and then the contact information will pop up. So it's called a dot card. And so I go to these networking events one, they see my hair. So when I walk into the room, boom, it all heads turn, right? And I, I walk very confidently, chin up, chest up. I walk with great posture. I walk very confidently. I walk in the room. And then when I'm talking to people, then they see me in person, then they read the shirt, right? Then it's boom. And it's like, okay, now they, now I really have their attention. Even if they didn't want to have, give me their attention. Now I got it already, even if they didn't want to. And then I top it off with the, I hit the business card, boop. It's like, oh, they're looking to scan the QR code. It's like, no, you tap. And so now at the teaching moment, 
So now I'm teaching him a little bit of my, my, my secret marketing tricks. So then I really reel in that connection because now it's like, well, I already got them with the hair. I already got their attention. And then the shirt probably made them laugh a little bit. And then I got to teach them. So when I make my, when I make my exit, it's like that guy made a pretty lasting impression because he, he was different. There was something about him that, and that one, two, three punch has, is something that definitely like for, for me ha- hasn't missed yet. And it's something I'm going to continue doing to every marketing event or conference that I go to. Just having these little corny things where I can stand out no matter who is in the room. Is there something like that that you kind of found? Yeah, I know my stuff before I go in. So I definitely, my tattoos are always out, you know, I'm always wearing a short sleeve. That's the little thing to get people in. But the biggest thing for me, I always do my research ahead of time. Every conference we go to, every networking event always has a list of the RSVPs, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person. I do my homework. I look at every single person on that list. I figure out who would be a good fit for our business. I figure out who would be a good partner for us if there's a service that we need. Yeah. I do my homework. I, I fill up my notebook full of research, full of notes, certain talking points for different people. And that's how I lead the conversation. I don't want to be too obvious, but I definitely want to make sure that I'm coming across as informative, coming across as educated. And I, yeah. I show them that this is something we want to do. I think that's a, a, an amazing point too, because you mentioned your tattoos. And like for me, like having in like the, my, my industry, I'm a male, a professional male, right? It usually is short, low trimmed hair. And like for me to walk in with a curly fro, for you to walk in with a, with your tattoos, but like walking in, being able to own it, it, it makes such a more meaningful impression. Despite that, like another thing too, like I was hosting an event and I was talking to this one guy and he was telling me like, Hey John, for the next one, if, especially if you start doing this on a bigger scale, you might want to start wearing like some like suits or things like that. And like for me, it's like, I can wear a suit and look amazing in a suit, but it's like, if I got a sprint, I can't sprint. I'm an athlete at heart, right? So it's like, if I don't have, I'm, I'm sporty. I'm, I, I, suits are too uptight for me. Yep. And I, 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 you know, I feel like I, I look great. I dress great when I do come prepare in a suit, but it's like, that's too much work, honestly, for me. And it's like, for me, as you said, if you come in prepared when, when you open your mouth and you're able to articulate yourself in a way that, you know, is, not only intelligent, but also captivating and grabs people's attention. And it doesn't matter what you're dressed in. I, I've seen a billionaire come in a plain black, a plain black Cal, Cal, Calvin Klein V-neck with some plain black jeans and some black sneakers. And it's like, this guy got a billion dollars. You think anyone's asking him to wear a suit? Once you get to that point, though. <laughs> but that, but it's not about getting there. It's about acting as if you are there. Because if you don't act as if you're there... If you're, if you're worried too about what people think now and you're creating this thing now, it's like you're, you'll forever be portraying something that's not authentic. And the sooner you can get into that authenticity, which is another like super key component when it comes to idea branding, at least for me, it's been paying off, you know, and, and dividend. And I can only imagine how much more it's going to pay off. Cause like I'll show up right now, like to podcasts and stuff like that and um, hoodie, hat, things like that. But I know the message I'm coming across is much more important. And for the people, of course, there's always going to be people that kind of think you're like, oh, he doesn't have a suit on or Oh, he doesn't have low, a low cut hair. Or, oh, he has facial hair. Whatever it may be, people will find whatever. But it's like my message aren't for those people. It's for the people that, that want to hear a message that are that are receptive. If a suit makes someone more credible, you're listening for the wrong reasons. I feel like you could generally learn something from every in- in- encounter, no matter how bad or evil or no matter if the person has totally opposite viewpoints, there's always something you could take away from every encounter. And I feel like uh, this is why I kind of like philosophy. I'm not the most astute philosopher, but that there's just way of thinking how like, having an open mind and being curious that coming from curiosity. And of course, some people are going to judge, but you don't need that many clients if you have a high ticket offer to make a lot of money, no matter what industry you're in. So it's like being okay with being yourself. And when it gets to that point where you do have a high ticket offer, I don't have one yet, but like when I do get to that point, people are not going to spend all this money for that they don't like. It's like, yeah, everyone has results, but if they're going to spend 10 grand, they're going to want to like you. Like it's a lot more. If they're spending 50 bucks, it doesn't matter. You have the information, they'll take it, they'll eat it up. But if you're going to spend 10,000, 25,000 on a mastermind, they don't, they're not spending that that money because, well, they wouldn't be spending that money if they did, disliked whoever was running that mastermind, right? It's because they relate with them, whether it's for their tattoo, whether it's for their, their comedic way of going about things or their persona, 
in their energy. But well, at the end of the day, it should be the value too. Oh yeah, of course. If you're providing great value to that business, all the other stuff shouldn't matter. That stuff is a great way to get in the door. Yeah. Once you're in the door, if you provide results, unless there's something crazy with the business person that's running that business, but you should have them locked. You shouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't grow curly hair. I can't grow <laughs> long hair. Barely got enough as it is. <laughs> so I, I got to have at least something going for me, you know? Yeah. That's what I mean. That, that too is coming, coming clutch then. I don't have any tattoos. Mm-hmm. So I, I have to get, I have to use the hair card. It, it's it's my, yeah. my best feature. But never yeah, get so, your business name tattooed on you because it might <laughs> fold. You never know what'll happen. Or you might <laughs> sell it one day. Oh my goodness. But yeah. So Andrew, let me actually write. So what? I wanted to kind of actually, we've been talking about branding this whole conversation. What is one of like the, the biggest mistakes you see? As far as uh, branding or just branding in general, in general? Just branding, marketing in general. Like we talked about so far this conversation, how do we find our unique value proposition? How do we find what makes us different? How do we start testing our ideas into the marketplace? How do we start getting in front of people? We talked about networking, how to make sure our brand comes across, not only through our messaging, through our content and marketing but also through when we show up to different appearances. What's a mistake that people tend to make when getting into branding side, anything branding related? It's like, what is a common mistake that you see that you usually have to fix when you're working with some of your clients and when you're just scrolling on social media? Usually it's where they're putting their time. The biggest thing that entrepreneurs, when they first start out, the hardest thing for them to figure out is how to time management, manage how much time they need to put into a certain aspect of what they're doing. Yeah. So... I see people try way too hard on social media. They put a lot of really good production value into it, which if that's your business, that's great. You need to be showing that. If it's not, you need to take a step back, make sure you're providing something valuable before working on the production value. Yeah. Amazing. Even if it's just a picture of you at a conference, just post that. You don't have to throw it into Adobe or whatever to make it look good. People are still going to like it. Yeah. One day when the money's there and you you have the resources to build that, That's perfectly great. But for now, just kind of keep it to the basics. Look at where you're actually putting your time. Make sure the majority of your time is going towards your sales and towards your current clients. And then everything else kind of needs to take a back step until you can afford to really put money into it and really push it forward. Yeah, amazing. And so, Andrew, you've been dropping nuggets this entire conversation. Where can we find you at? Where can we connect with you at? Just Just in case we want to maybe move forward with the services that you're offering or just stay connected with you so we can learn from all the marketing tricks and secrets that you've been able to gather across the years. Yeah, John, it's always great talking with you. I hope we can find an excuse to do this again soon. (laughs) You can find us at 734marketing.com. My name is Andrew Lenzo too. You can find me on social. We'll do free consultations or whatever. Even if you're not looking to buy a service from us, we're happy to point you in the right direction for where your business is at. We've, I hate, I hate to say this, but we've turned down a lot of businesses just because it's not a good fit for us, but we've never pointed somebody in the wrong direction. So come check us out. If there's anything we can do to help you with your venture, anything we talked about today, we do a lot of social media. We do a lot of podcasts, a lot of emails. You can also listen to our free podcast, uh, Marketing and Coffee. It's on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. We have some really cool guests on from across the globe. They all just talk about different marketing topics over a cup of coffee. So yeah and yeah. go go Hopefully check out we'll my see you down the road go check out my episode on the marketing coffee po- coffee podcast mm-hmm. as well I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well it's um, featured on our website and it's featured on i think i put made a post on my ig as well if i'm not it should be on Thank there <laughs> but awesome. Andrew, now it's time for the final five questions the qu- way we end every podcast episode question number one we're gonna get a little bit in depth now into your into the mind of andrew what is the most impactful lesson you've learned in life Wow. Can we cut out some of the silence that's going to come before I answer? (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I cut them out. (laughs) Uh, The most impactful. Say that one more time. Yeah. What is the most impactful lesson you've learned in life? Most impactful. I would say that nobody owes anything to you. You got to make your own way. So surround yourself with people who are going to not cater to you, but are going to push you to be a better person. What is the most admirable trait a person can have? Honesty. If you had to change someone's life with one book, which book would you recommend? Oh, shoot. I'm going to pull it up. Do, do, do. Sorry, I'm making you edit a lot today. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you if you need some help. I would say The Gap in the Game by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. I heard a, a tons of good books. I mean, not a tons of good recommendations from for that book. So I'm looking forward to when I finally come across reading yeah. it. 
to reading it. And I'd also recommend downloading Blinkless. It's an app for, I think it's like 10 bucks a month. You can get unlimited access to any type of readings that you need and they will just give you the highlights. So if you only have 20 minutes to listen in the morning, you'll still get some good information, even if you don't have two hours to read at night. Amazing. And so what is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? I'm just trying to make my community a better place. I'm just trying to leave something behind, try to improve. Even if it's one person's life, you know, that's really my goal. And no matter where someone is right now listening to this, what is what would you say is the first step that they could take to begin their walk to wealth? Grab a notebook, write down what you're thinking, write down your ideas, and then make a plan and put it in place. See what happens. Amazing. Andrew, thanks again for hopping on. Thanks again. It's 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 weird how our paths cross and the world works in a mysterious way. And I know this is definitely going to be you no know, connection where we, we're definitely going to get a lot of collaborations going in the new year and in 2023. So I'm glad you were able to come on to the podcast and just drop the nuggets that you did this episode. John, you're the man. Thanks again for having me. We'll definitely do this again, whether it's a live on our page or maybe we'll look at a webinar in the future. Yeah, yeah definitely. Fun.